James A. Garfield stated that the sanctity of marriage and the family relation makes the cornerstone of our American society and civilization. He was correct about that, uh, but you could go much further as the sanctity of marriage really becomes the foundation stone of not just our American society and civilization, but of society itself. Because society is made up of people and people are made in homes. When the home is threatened or when it's destroyed, then people will not be built as God desires them to be. And society as a whole then will suffer. Our nation today is in trouble because of all of the problems that we see, the rising crime rate, the even though Roe v. Wade was overturned, the push for abortion and abortion rights, uh, homosexuality, drunkenness, fornication, adultery, uh, witchcraft, hatred, disrespect of parents, or disrespect for authority in general, and you could go on and on. A nation cannot long exist when they leave God. Solomon said that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. As we mentioned, though, the, everything begins at the home. And that re includes respect for authority, but also lawlessness begins in the home. Uh, there's an old, adage, <coughs> an old adage that we have, as the twig is, is bent, so grows the tree. And that's true in the home as well. When we, as we teach our children, train our children, as we train them, that's the way in which they're going to grow. One of the attacks against the home is that of humanism, and we'll also start including liberalism in a few minutes. But humanism, which we started talking about last week, is not humanitarianism. Humanism will, in fact, destroy humanitarianism. Humanism is best defined by themselves and their own documents. The Humanist Manifesto No. 1 was written in 1933. It was revised and updated in 1973. Both of them begin by denying the existence of God the divinity of Jesus, the inspiration of the Bible, the existence of a soul, and denial of life after death, whether you're talking about heaven or hell. And we looked at some quotes which they stated, but one of the interesting ones that we see, this is in the 1973 document, they state, quote, salvationism, based on, upon mere affirmation, still, still appears as harmful, diverting people with false hopes of heaven hereafter. Thus, to believe in a heaven or hell is, according to them, harmful. And being harmful, they then have to eliminate those who would advocate such. But with the elimination of God, as they set forth, there is no purpose or value in life. In fact, they quote, they say, quote, we can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. And then they go on to state in that same paragraph, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. With no purpose in life, then what good is life? And one of the great problems that this type of thinking causes is that of suicide. 
if there's no purpose in life, then why should we continue to exist in this old world? What difference will it make? But when they came to writing the second one in 1973, they recognized some problems. Because, in fact, they write, quote, events since then, talking about uh, their first one, make the earlier statement seem far too optimistic. Nazism has shown the depths of brutality of which humanity is capable. Other totalitarian re regimes have suppressed human rights without ending poverty. Science has sometimes brought evil as well as good. Those things are the natural result, though, of the humanistic thinking. That's the problem. And while they re refuse to recognize such, it still is the natural result. You cannot avoid things like Nazism, totalitarian regimes, and so forth, without recognizing it comes as a direct result of humanistic thinking. If you eliminate humanistic thinking and you replace it with God, the belief in God, the belief in the morals that God has set forth, the knowledge of a hereafter, that that hereafter will include either heaven or hell, then you can eliminate those types of totalitarian regimes and Nazism. But they continue to affirm the very things that results in those doctrines. With humanism and without God, there is no absolutes, no right, no wrong. Morals become self-determined and situational, which is basically do your own thing as long as it doesn't harm anyone. And thus, what they have desired and what we started seeing, and we mentioned this last week, was to remove any distinction between males and females and the roles of males and females. And so now then, we have people who claim to be non-binary and parents allowing their children, well, we're not going to allow them to say whether they're male or female until they can make the decision on their own. Uh, yet that's what we see as a result of humanism and the humanistic thought. Uh, all of these things come as a direct result. In the area of sexuality, thus they state, quote, in the area of sexuality, we believe that intolerant attitudes, often cultivated by orthodox religions and puritanical cultures, unduly repress sexual conduct. The right to birth control, abortion, and divorce should be recognized. While we do not approve of exploitative denigrating forms of sexual expression, neither do we wish to prohibit by law or social sanction sexual behavior between consenting adults. Let me just pause there. Why only between consenting adults, though? If, are you going to repress someone's desires in regards to someone who is non-consensual? And if you are, by what right do you do so? Isn't that oppressive? And the very things that they are accusing Orthodox religion of doing, aren't they doing it in relationship to someone who might have a desire for someone who cannot consent? But they go on. Uh, the many varieties of sexual exploration should not in themselves be considered evil. 
without countenancing or countenancing mindless permissiveness or unbridled promiscuity. A civilized society should be a tolerant one. Short of harming others or compelling them to do likewise, individuals should be permitted to express their sexual proclivities and pursue their lifestyles as they desire. Now then, uh, if short of harming others, but why can't we harm others? Shouldn't we be tolerant of their sexual proclivities? If so, then if they have the desire to harm others, then why should we object? In fact, shouldn't we encourage them in their harm of others? And why should it be only consenting adults if an adult wants to have uh, sexual contact with an infant? Why should it be oppressed? Why should we not be tolerant concerning those things? You see, they talk about here is what we want. Absolutely no restraint. But then over here they want to say, if you are not tolerant of all of these things, you're evil. But we cannot say that anything is thus evil, or else you're evil itself. So to say that having sexual contact with someone who is not consenting, or harming others, Neither one of those are evil, and we have to tolerate those things according to their own statement. As far as being consistent with their statement. Now then, the reason they view sexual expression in such a way, just do whatever you want to, is because they've rejected God's standard of of morals. Notice this statement. We affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Ethics stem from human need and interest. To deny this distorts the whole basis of life. Thus, what could be considered wrong? If uh, an adult wants to have incest with a child, then that's his experience. And it would have to be considered right because moral values, according to them, derive their source from that human experience. That's his human experience or her human experience, thus to do have incest, pedophilia, those have to be right. Murder, euthanasia, which is, means good death, referred to as mercy killing, it's the murder of the aged or the infirmed. Abortion, murdering babies in the womb, infanticide, murdering newborn babes, and other things, those cannot be considered wrong. That's why we have a president who has been advocating for abortion. We've had presidents who advocated for and allowed infanticide. If an an abortion is blotched and the baby is born, then you just let it starve to death and die. That's what is being advocated in our society today. Why? Because of humanistic thinking. All situations or all ethics are autonomous and situational, and we have to allow tolerance in whatever views. Sexually, there's not anything wrong. Incest, pedophilia, bestiality, rape, doesn't matter what you, what 
type of perversion that you want to talk about, it cannot be considered wrong or evil. Discrimination in any form, whether social or sexual, racial, social, any other type of discrimination could not be considered wrong or evil. And thus, if you get into the, that aspect of sexual, the pedoph pedophile, well, he can't be discriminated against. What he does cannot be considered wrong or evil. Years back, when homosexuality was just being advocated, I said, the same arguments that the homosexuals use, the pedophiles will use. And guess what? That's exactly what we're seeing now. And they're trying to make pedophilia something that is normal and accepted by society. But they say morals are from the human experience. If morals are from the human experience, whose human experience should we use? And should we go by? Should we go by Hitler's? Or maybe Mussolini or Stalin or Khrushchev? Or maybe we should go by Ted Bundy's uh, human experience. Or what about Jeffrey Dahmer? Who, yes, he became a Christian after the fact. But the reason that he would murder and then cannibalize his victims is because he had accepted the humanistic viewpoints. He did not have God in his life. He came to understand that with God, those things were wrong. But why not have his ethic before he learned better? Whose human experience will we go by? What about some other mass murderer? Why not go by theirs? You say, if it's from the human experience, whose human experience are we going to go by? To say that morals are, and this is their terms, situational and autonomous, in reality is a contradiction in terms. Morals cannot be both situational and at the same time autonomous. Now, autonomous... We know the term because we recognize that each congregation of the Lord's church is autonomous. It means, very simply, self-ruling or self-governing. That each, in relationship to the church, each congregation oversees itself and does not have any control over anyone else. So if morals are autonomous, then I become a law unto myself and you become a law unto yourself. Whatever I feel is best for me, then that's what I'm under obligation to do. Whatever you feel is best for you is what you're under obligation to do. So everyone is a law to themselves and no one would have the right to impose their law upon anyone else. I could not impose my law because I'm self-ruling, I'm autonomous. I could not impose it upon you, though, because you're autonomous. You're self-ruling or self-governing. So if you believe that it's wrong to rape and to murder, but I believe, well, rape and murder is all right. And I thus feel like I should do it. And I should enjoy it. You need to be tolerant of my views. Let's go open up all the jails. Because you cannot say that anything is wrong. And if I feel an action is right because of my self-governing laws, I'm governing myself, if I think something is right, then in reality i am become under obligation to do those things. So a murderer or a rapist out here, 
if he thinks that is right, then he's under obligation to go out and murder and rape. It's not all that different with some individuals in our society today. But that's if it is autonomous. On the other hand, if morals are situational, then you really have no standard of right or wrong on its own basis. You can never say that murder is wrong. Why? Because it all depends on the situation. And if I put it in the right situation, then murder becomes right. Of course, who's to, to determine what situation is, what, is which? But if the situation is such that rape or murder or adultery or any other action appears best, of course we could always ask best for whom, but that becomes where you're no longer autonomous, doesn't it? then I'm under obligation to perform those actions because I've determined that the situation demands such. Joseph Fletcher, in his advocating situational ethics, in his book, basically gave an illustration of situation ethics in which a woman had been captured. She was in a, uh, it was during a period of war, and so she was in a POW camp. And her husband was there along with her children. So to get out of that camp, she committed adultery with guards and then was able to go home And so because that situation was of such a nature that it allowed her to go home to her husband and family, then that adultery became right. And that is what she was under obligation to do. Now then, that presents one side of it, but what about the rest of the story? You know, you could always ask. When she got to her husband, and he knows that she's committed adultery against him. What about that? And what does it do to that family relationship because of her adultery? And you could go on and on from that standpoint. But see, an, an action that we might consider right in this situation becomes wrong in another situation, and an action which we consider wrong in a situation might become right in a situation at a different place or time. There's nothing that is really ever right or wrong. And that's why we say that there are, in reality, these two ideas of ethics are contradictory one to another. If they are autonomous, they cannot be situational. If they're situational, they cannot be autonomous. Let's turn to liberalism, though, for a few minutes. And we'll just begin with this as well. But modernistic or liberalistic theology essentially is humanistic. If you look at the signers of the Humanist Manifesto, both 1 and 2, you will find, even though it states that they do not believe in God, and all of these things which we quoted last week and this week from their manifestos, and yet you would have people who are high up religiously signing these. An example of such... I'm just going to use this one as an illustration primarily, but his name was John Shelby Spong. He was Bishop of Newark, New Jersey, the Diocese of the Episcopal Church. Now, he died last year, September of last year. But he wrote a book, Living in Sin, with a question mark after it. Is it really sin, basically? 
Now, humanism, in its very basic nature, rejects God and God's existence. To give Spong credit, he does at least believe that God exists. Now, it's, uh, we might argue whether it's the God of the Bible, it's not, or the God that we believe in, because the God that you and I believe in is not the God he believed in. But he at least acknowledged the existence of God. Humanists reject the Bible totally. Spong and liberalism rejects the Bible as the inerrant, infallible, verbally inspired Word of God. Now then, a word of caution in relationship to this and what we sometimes hear, well, that's all semantics. It's not. They might want to claim such, but it's not a matter of semantics. Because what they have done through the years is to change the meaning of words. And they use words in a different way than what is normally used or what we use them as. Take the word inspiration. Now, Spong believed in inspiration, but what did he mean by that? As to what do we mean by that? Do you know that atheists believe that some people are inspired? Now then, take a, a beautiful painting, for example. And if they look at it, and they, that the person who painted that had to be inspired. Doesn't believe in God. But they believe in an inspiration that that person was inspired to be able to paint such a beautiful painting. And that's just an illustration. You could talk about a work of art, reading a good book that inspires you. Well, the person must have been inspired who wrote this, right? And so they talk about inspiration, but it's not the inspiration that's talked about from God's Word. They, many of them don't even believe God exists, but still believe in inspiration, just not inspiration of God. Others, though, believe God exists. This is where Spong would fall into. And an inspiration from God. But while they would basically liken the to the atheistic inspire, inspiration in relationship to a work of art or a good book or something like that, they would agree with that, that that person must have been inspired, of, they would say inspired of God, that God inspired him to be able to paint that or to write that. Because look at the way it, which it makes people feel. When it comes to the Bible, though, of course, humanism says, deny it altogether. The liberal, the modernist of our day, would say that, yes, the Bible is inspired of God. It's inspired of God the same way that person who painted that picture or wrote that other book was inspired of God. That God inspired them to do that. And so when it comes to the Bible, yes, the Bible is inspired of God. They don't mean what we mean by it, though. They mean that it's just a good work of literature. It has some good thoughts. It presents a good message. And so, yes, those writers of the Bible, they were inspired. But they would also add, there's mistakes in the Bible, sure. There's places where it got things wrong. There's some, if you talk about contradictions, yes, there, there's contradictions all through the Bible, they would claim. Anachronisms, prejudices, 
Have you ever heard of those of a religious vein who will attack Paul's credibility because Paul taught that man is to take a leadership role in the church? And that Paul was, well, you know what Paul was. He just hated women. And that's why he wrote those things. And so it was good for that culture, but we've progressed beyond that. And now then, women can take as much of a leadership role as men can. Now why do they believe such? Because they believe in an inspired Bible, but not a verbally inspired, plenary inspired Word of God. They believe thus that there's mistakes and errors and that they wrote by their own thoughts, their own feelings, the custom of that day. And so if the custom of that day or their feelings or do not harmonize with what we see today, then they were wrong about those things. It was just for that time. That's a result of that form of inspiration. And yet they will talk about that the Bible is inspired. It's oftentimes not enough to listen to the words. You have to know the meaning of the words. Uh, In a debate, in teaching debates and studying debates, the very first thing that you do in a debate, the very first thing that you set out, is here's the proposition, here's the definition of terms, so that everyone knows what you're talking about. Questions are wonderful, but a lot of times questions, you don't know where they're coming from. A precisely worded question is either true or false, for example, but an imprecisely one, you don't know. It could be yes, it could be no depending on how you define the term. So you have to define the terms. You have to understand what they mean by the term. That's the way it is with inspiration. They do not believe, Spong did not believe, that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, plenary, verbally. Plenary, that means the totality of it. Verbally, that means every single word was inspired by God. Let me give you an, another illustration. The resurrection of Christ. We believe that Christ was raised. They believe Christ was raised. Now then, to say those two things, you would think would be the same thing, right? Wrong. Not at all. We believe that Jesus physical body was put in a grave, and three days after that, that physical body was raised from that grave, and that physical body walked around and lived for another 50 days, as per the Bible's teaching. They don't believe that. But they believe in the resurrection of Christ. What do you mean thus? They believe that the resurrection of Christ deals with the resurrection of his ideas and his teachings. So when you teach something about Christ or teach something about the Bible, that is resurrecting that idea and thus that has the reference to the resurrection of Christ. Thus, or if you bring those thoughts to people's minds, then you're teaching it again. You're resurrecting Christ by teaching such. So it's a resurrection of ideas and thoughts. It's not a physical, bodily resurrection. But yet both of them will say, I believe in the resurrection of Christ. So I say, you have to understand what they mean by what they say. But 
as they believe this and teach this, thus the Bible was written only by the writer's own thinking and feeling. When you accept that view, then when you get over to the morals, the ethic that the Bible presents, those things can be rejected. Just as women's role in the church and man's leadership role, that can be rejected. Why? Because Paul was only writing by his own experience, his own feelings, and the culture of that day. And if the culture of our day is different, which it is because of humanism, then what Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14 can be totally rejected. Now then, that's the view of liberalism. I'm going to stop there next Sunday afternoon, Lord willing. Or maybe it's next one. Next Sunday afternoon, Brother Jason will be preaching. So the next one... We'll continue on with actually some of the thoughts that John Shelby Spong presented in his book, Living in Sin? Question mark. But hopefully you can start recognizing that we are in a fight for the, to use the phrase that was used by our president, the soul of America, but also the soul of the world. Because if we give up God and the Bible... All we have is mass confusion and error and total destruction. When we give up, when we compromise concerning the doctrine that's found in the Bible, the morals, the ethical standard that God presents within the Bible, then we give up our society. We give up the home. But these things are affecting the home. And we'll get into that, Lord willing, next time as well. The only way in which to have a solution to these things is to go back to an understanding that God inspired, that God is, that God inspired the Bible, every word of it, that there is an eternal destiny for which we are going to be spending an eternity either in heaven or in hell. And that only if we be or only as we are obedient to the will of God will we be able to go to heaven. When we reject that, then hell will be the result. We can escape that hell though by obedient, obedience to the gospel. And while humanism finds that abhorrent and wants to destroy it, yet it's still going to stand true. And thus, if you have not been obedient to that gospel, we would encourage you to be obedient this afternoon. Let us baptize you into Christ based upon your faith, repentance, confession of your faith. And if you have become a Christian, but you're not lived the way that God wants you to live, then let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. And a loving Heavenly Father stands waiting and willing, desires to forgive us and to save us, and to hold us as His children with all of the blessings that that implies. So if you need to come this afternoon, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.